I would say if you don't want to be a songwriter, my advice is be one. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. And the reason is that I don't know anything else that will so effectively ensure the possibility of sanity. Hi, I'm Elijah, and welcome to my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters. Today, my guest is Grammy-nominated songwriter Louise Goffin. As the daughter of Carole King and Jerry Goffin, Louise has melody and songwriting flowing through her very being and DNA. Louise has recently been recording a new album at the infamous Muscle Shoals studio. She tells us about her early influences, the benefits of co-writing with other songwriters, the balance of writing, recording and performing, how the muse shows up for her, how her writing has developed and changed over the years, and gives us insights into her new record. Thank you for listening. Hi Louise, thank you for being my guest on my podcast, Songwriting for Songwriters. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Excellent. It's so nice to see you. You too. You too. So we first met online on a songwriter's retreat with um, Chris Difford from Squeeze during the pandemic. And uh, we decided to write a song together called Dominoes, yes. um, which I really, really enjoyed writing with you. And one of the things that I enjoyed the most was how thorough you were. Like every single note, every word, every chord change, you were so diligent. And I really appreciated that. You know, as as a songwriter myself, when I write my own songs, I'm obviously doing that. But sometimes in collaboration, that isn't always the case. But I really enjoyed how much attention to detail you, you put into that moment of writing a song together. So my first question is, how often do you collaborate with other writers and what do you gain from that? Is it something you enjoy doing? And what challenges does it present to you as a writer? Well, I actually prefer collaborating than writing alone. I, when I get a song that I love, that I've written alone, I, I always give myself a pat on, on the back like it's, it's amazing that I got the song even finished because on my own, I'm not as inclined to call the song done. Okay. You know, I have a, a lot of ideas and I put them on my phone and it's like, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. But when I'm with other people, those ideas become, okay, uh, well, what if this was the verse? And then we went here for the chorus. And so I, I much prefer collaborating. So you, do you, you kind of enjoy almost like the time pressure or that, that kind of having someone else in the room, you know, the kind of diamond and under pressure thing, you quite like that kind of element to it. Yeah, I talk about this a lot. Um, when I do songwriting masterclasses, I, I talk about how when you write with another person, you double your life experience. It's not even you double your songwriting uh, skills, but you double the life experience that you can draw from because you've got two people's life experience. So I just think it's great. I think it's a wonderful thing to collaborate. And, uh, you know, the biggest hump with collaborating, I think for most people is the fear of, not having ideas in the moment or or not being able to play guitar well enough or, you know, not being confident enough to say what they think with somebody new. Uh, and those things really just take practice. Yeah. It's, it's, it's worth getting over those fears because everybody's just as insecure as everybody else. That's so true. That's very true. And I think you're right. There's, there's a, a trust you have to have in your own ability and in the other person's ability and trust in the moment of something's going to come, you know, there's, there's yeah. that spontaneous, elusive, creative thing, which happens and you just have mm -hmm. to trust that, you know? Yeah. So one of the things I love about your songs is that you sound really, you have a, such a strong identity as a songwriter and all of your songs sound very natural. Like I believe you. Each time I hear your songs, I believe what you're saying. But also you 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 do kind of um not 
every one of your songs sounds different from the other song, but it doesn't sound like you're genre hopping. It always sounds like you. Oh, that's, re- that's lovely. Thank you. Well, you've, one of the, the track you released recently, Show Me How, sounds to me like yeah. it's almost kind of like an alternative 90s precious jewel. Uh, and it's really inviting, but there's loads of great arrangement in it too. I'm really interested to know when you're writing alone, how is do you have a process is it always different well it's interesting you say that because um i did write that song and that recording is from the 90s i have a lot of songs sitting around and and you know i don't i have more songs than i can keep track of sometimes i just you know if that if i'm not feeling like i want to record or release something They just sit and it might be, I might have a great song, but it doesn't reflect where I am at the moment. But 10 years later, I might hear it and go, wow, this is a jewel. Uh, That happened with that song. I listened to it and I've been in this mode of hearing things different than I ever heard them in my life. And, And I attribute that to the fact that I took um I went to engineering school in 2019 I lived in Nashville for more than half a year and I went to the Blackbird Academy which is you know one of the greatest studios with the greatest mic collection in the world uh and we spent a lot of time doing theory and pro tools and then we spent also a ton of time half of the time in recording in the recording studio And ever since I've done that, I've been very empowered, you know, for a start with recording my own things, but it's made me hear everything differently in, in a good and not so good way. The the good way is things that used to mystify me. And I go, wow, how did they do that? God, I want to do that. What is oh my gosh, that's so amazing. You know, suddenly I go, I know what they're doing. I know what that is. And there's less mystique around the sound of records. Um, And so songs are boiled down to just the quality of the song itself. I'm not as fooled by, you know, techniques or compression or mixing, you know, ear candy things, although I love ear candy. I I just mean it's easier to discern. And it's empowering because I'm able to do more myself, but it's also, you know, when you go to the movies and you have, you know, you you love it when your disbelief is, um, you know, you can sustain it. And all of a sudden some something walks in the scene, you go, oh, that's I just don't believe it anymore. You you said that earlier. Um, so 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 that's the downside is that it's harder for me to find music that moves me on all levels, you know. But uh, that song, well, it's it's helped me with listening to some of my old things because I always had this thing of like somebody else knows. Somebody knows how to record better. Somebody knows how to mic better. Somebody knows how to, you know, sing or, you know, apologies about that side of tune. Well, all of a sudden, the things that I did as demos in the 90s, like, that's a, that's amazing. <laughs> because, you know, you didn't have Pro Tools or you didn't, you, you ha- I used Cubase and Digital Performer back then, but you know, everybody tunes everything now, everybody quantizes everything now. So just the fact that that recording was done where I was playing live and singing a lot and the band played it and it was mic'd well, it's really just a lovely recording of a lovely song and, you know, a performance of a band. So that was a long explanation, but... Uh, that was a song, again, it was quiet. And I would say back then, particularly in the 90s, you know, when Nirvana was all the rage, like all my little quiet jewel songs seem so throwaway to me. They seem so indulgent, like, 
well, I like it, but nobody else will, you know? And I used to really enjoy playing that song live. And I remember that the capo was way up the neck song. And it was this cool little dainty song. And when I listened to it lately, particularly the little piano thing on it, dee, 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 I was like, well, this is, this is so cool. This is really, I'm just going to put this out. I don't need to re-record this. You know, I'm in the middle of a record. I don't need to, you know, find some other version of it. I'm just going to put it out as it is. So, uh, yeah, that that's the long story behind that. As far as recording goes and, and writing, I don't really write that much on my own. And I go through phases of writing and I go through phases of recording and I go through phases of playing live. And when I'm doing one of those three, I pretty much suck at the other two, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been in a recording mode all year and I love the songs I'm recording. And I probably wrote a great deal of them during the pandemic around the time you and I wrote Domino's. And I was writing a bunch then, and now I've been recording and, you know, getting the tracks how I want them. And I haven't been doing much writing. And the other day, uh, some people asked me to play, you know, um, family members just, you know, hey, play us a song. And I picked up a guitar and I, I, I was just... I had no voice. I was in like not good performing shape at all, you know, probably a little stuffed up. And I was like, oh boy, I'm really going to have to, you know, woodshed and get my, get myself together if I'm going to start performing when this record is done out. It does take it. You're right though. There are, there are very different disciplines, aren't they? And um, record, rehearsing, recording and songwriting, they do take up, each of those things takes up a big chunk of your mind. So I can see how you just, one can cycle through a chapter until that chapter's over, and then you move into the rehearsing, then the recording. Was there, was there a moment when you decided to become a songwriter? Was there a, did you remember kind of deciding to, to do that with your life? Um, I don't know about with my life. Um, I'm sure I was about eight. I mean, I was playing piano since I was about six and I was very escapist in my room around five or six. I had a little record player and I loved Fantasia. I loved looking at the photos and I had a monkey's record. Um, I had the, I remember those two records. I don't remember what else I had in my collection. Oh, Peter and the Wolf. I was very influenced by Peter and the Wolf and Fantasia. Um, and I, I suppose seeing songwriting or being an artist as a living, you know, of course was modeled when I saw my mom doing it. And I just assumed, oh, if you write songs, then you get to go on tour and then you get to play you know, these beautiful halls and you get to, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it was a different era. I mean, just right now, I mean, there's probably 4 billion more people on the planet. Yep, yep. Uh, so everything, everything's changed. It's almost like, you know, when you think back, it, think back to, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, it's, you know, before the turn of the century, it's almost like a storybook from another time. Like our time is just so different now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And there's a lot more writers and artists in the world, isn't there as well? There's a, a, the, it's a you know, it's a very crowded area, I suppose. Did, did you, I mean, obviously your parents are two of the greatest songwriters that ever existed. Do you feel... Um, did, Thank you. If, did they impact and influence your writing? And and if so, how, how was there a kind of specific piece of advice or, um, you know, what, what did they kind of, if they. Uh, no, they, they never gave me any advice. And if they did, their advice might have been utterly rejected. I mean, my father's advice would have been make money. <laughs> that would have been his advice. Um, and my mother didn't give me advice either. Um, but what they did do is 
you know, they modeled a, a level of excellence that, you know, I, I've in, internalized, yeah. um, not just in their writing, but also the things I was exposed to. It, it, it's just, you know, I, I just, I was surrounded by a high level of excellence, but I also think by osmosis, I got a sense of melody from my mom, you know, the way she would, things would lift, you know, and, and from my dad, I feel like I absorbed this simplicity and, um, you know, that, that's just, and, and that's an intellectualized version of it. I'm sure there's just, you know, genetic stuff as well going on, but, uh, but it's one of the things I hear in your songwriting, actually. It's not necessarily their influence, but something you just said about your songs sound simple, but they're not simple, they're sophisticated. But they, but listening to them is like a kind of, um, it's not a difficult thing to listen to. It's very, e it's easy to listen. And I don't mean easy listening. It's just, it's kind of very magnetic and it's it's a wonderful listen. But when, when it opens up, because as a songwriter myself, you realise that like, this is not a simple song. This is very sophisticated, but it's not clever. You know, it's very kind of beautifully arranged and done. And I don't mean just in parts and the record side is the actual structure of the song is so it feels like it always existed. One of the things I experience is myself as a writer is songs seem to arrive, you know, and so I can sit down sometimes with a guitar or piano and purposefully write a song, but those songs are very different from songs that arrive and where you may have just picked up a guitar or had the feeling and something will just come through. Do you, do you have a similar experience to that where, where things, some, I guess I'm asking like, do you write the songs or do the songs write you? Do they sometimes arrive through you? It's a bit of both. I mean, I've had, um, I've had both experiences usually with other people, although I had this magical thing happen where I, one of the things I've kept in my life and not thrown out are cassettes, you know, of ideas or rehearsals or gigs or, you know, and, for, you know, I guess they're easily stored and I always threw them in a box. Mm -hmm. So I have cassettes going back to when I was so young, maybe 16. Um, and I got a cassette machine and they're hard to find these days because the belts on them wear, the rubber on them wears out. And, and this one was annoying because you couldn't rewind it. You know, you had to like play the whole thing and find what you were looking for. But I ran one off that was from the early nineties. I was in London and uh, it wasn't labeled. I think it said October 93 on it is all it said. And there were some rough mixes of things. And then all of a sudden there's this really faint guitar line. It's really cool. And I'm singing a song and I think I'm singing someone else's song. Cause I, I, it, it's really like formed and kind of bluesy and um, it just feels like a form song. But then I stop and I hear myself like looking for a, a guitar bit and then and I hear wait a minute I'm writing this song I, I am listening to a recording of me writing the song wow and um the, the guitar part was really cool I don't even remember it now because I I went to the piano and I figured it out on the piano and then on the piano I had this whole other thing that was great and the lyric was a little like in terms of the genders and my point of view in it, it wasn't something I really wanted to say, but the music was great and I kind of wasn't sure what to do with it. Then I saw Get Back, the Beatles documentary, and I saw how Paul McCartney would play things and just keep changing the words yeah. and how these like super famous songs that you know how they go, they're singing totally different lyrics. Yeah. And I thought, wait a minute, I can just change the lyric in this song. I could change the story by talking to a friend instead of a lover. And, and you know, I just changed a couple of things in it. And suddenly, bam, I had this amazing song that 
I wrote myself, which is always like, hey, I did it myself. But yeah. also it was just, it fell out of the sky. It was just yeah. given yeah. to me yeah. 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 because yeah. I happened to have a cassette running that day and I happen to still have it. So so that was one experience like that where I was writing a really cool song in the room and I just happened to have it. And recently, uh, Billy Steinberg, who is a super successful, he wrote Like a Virgin and True Colors. And, um, you know, I interviewed him for my podcast, Song Chronicles. And I called him up a couple months ago and I said, hey, I'm making a record. Would you write with me? You know, like I timidly, he's like, yeah, sure, I'll come over. And he came over and he gave me a bunch of lyrics and we didn't really finish anything. And I gave him music to write lyrics to. And he later told me he had a lot going on in his life and he didn't think he could write lyrics to the music I gave him. But if I wanted to do anything with any of the lyrics he gave me, you know, I had his blessing. And one of the songs, I think when he was sitting here, yeah, he was sitting here. It was a beautiful lyric. And I think in five minutes, I wrote some music and put it on a memo and I sent it to him. I said, I said, well, this is amazing. Can I do this? And he said, yeah, I think that's that's good. Go ahead, do it. So that was like a five minute song. And then another song, I really loved the lyric and I just picked up a guitar and he couldn't hear it. He said, I need a demo with La La La's on it to really be able to hear, but I could hear it. And I went to Muscle Shoals, Alabama recently and I brought those songs and, you know, Spooner Oldham played on them. I mean, he is just legendary has played with everyone and he's amazing his his piano playing just makes you want to die because you you feel like you're listening you know it's like ray charles is playing on your stuff you know it, it, and you know but it's spooner album and david hood who was in traffic and played on you know all those old records by the way spooner oldham played the piano on aretha franklin's natural woman like oh, okay. he's the guy yeah. um so i i brought these songs and i was thinking man these songs were like written in five minutes and they're they're so good you know what happened yeah it's a funny and, thing it's a funny thing how i mean from my point of view, the ones that I tend to write down laboriously and try and write, they're, they're not so good. The ones that are the quick ones are the ones that are, seem to go down the best and I enjoy the most because I, I like the being a kind of elusive, mysterious quality where you don't know what how it happened or why. It just happened in the moment. Is that important to you to have a feeling of excitement or mystery to that when that happens? I, well, yeah, I, I definitely have reverence for yeah. that occurring. I feel like it's bigger than me. Yeah. And as you say, you know, as you said earlier, it feels like the songs are already there and I'm just writing them down. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, something I say often to myself is that, you know, if we're a fish and we're in water all the time, we don't know we're in water. Even the song you and I wrote, Dominoes, that song came so easily. I felt like the chords were like, you know, there was just no effort in them. And and even the words just came out. I mean, we, we tweaked and said, well, let's make this line better. But, you know, uh, the words really just, the story told itself in a way, and it didn't really even know what it was about, but it felt like it was something that needed to be said. And it's one of those things where you, you you figure out the meaning later, or the song is smarter than you, and later you realize the song is teaching you something. You know, a place in your life where you're where you need to recognize where you are, and the song tells you that, and the song is a few steps ahead of you in your human life. Um, that that happens, but also I've had the experience of needing my skills to write something. For example, I mean, I have a couple of songs I really like. 
And they took a super long time because they had music before lyrics. Yep. And it was really hard to make the lyrics sound like they always wanted to be there. That's interesting. I I think um, often a question often asked is words or music first as a songwriter. For me personally, I tend to, it's music first, although I will be always listening out for a title or something somebody said. Uh, and I think from that perspective as writing from a music first point of view, I think the melody that you hear in your head or you write has a kind of architecture. And so my my trip, if you like, is to try and let the words fall into the shape of the melody. Um, so I'm interested to know, is it what I was going to ask you, is it words or music first? And do you does it take a time to get the words if you're music first or the other way around? Well, music comes way more naturally to me, um, but I have more discipline than I used to because I was so enamored with multi-track recording, you know, and and I'm a multi-instrumentalist, so I just like couldn't wait to put the bass down, couldn't wait to put the guitar, the keyboard part, you know. I wanted to arrange it the, the, the second I could, and I'd often do that before I had a song, and... You know, there was just things that I feel were, you know, they they were indulgent or they'd be fun, but they, you know, they were more kind of groove based and they didn't have melodies and I'd have all this music. Um, so I like, lately it doesn't really feel like a song unless they're happening together. Although my my offspring, my two sons, they're they're amazing musicians. Um, you know, they're producers, multi-instrumentalists, engineers, songwriters, singers, performers. I mean, they do they do the whole thing. And my youngest son, who just, you know, he lives with me and he, he'll come up and he'll say, Mom, listen to this. And it, it's it's kind of jaw dropping what he does in three hours but he's he is very much a believer in making the ear candy first okay and and i've you know had this debate with him before i said look if you write the song first think how much fun you'll have producing it you know and you'll have a really great song and the lyrics will be good and it'll be like you know it'll be a really well built house and then you can decorate it and he is he says no no because then it's going to be boring he said if you get something that sounds really cool first and then you put the lyrics on it you know you're going to have a really cool sounding recording so now i'm not purist but i think all ways that you get there are you know, they're all justifiable and they're all legitimate. And it's, you know, whatever it is, I think the most important thing is to have your own palette and truth detector finely tuned. So whatever you're doing, however you're doing it, you know what to throw out and you know what to keep. And and to me, there's just, there's just nothing else more valuable than that. That's, there's no right way to do it i think that's really the heart that's something that i say when i'm asked about songwriting is you've got to know your you've got to have a quality control but you also need to know who you are as a songwriter who you are as a person what you know was it the fantasia poster you had growing up and that combines with the monkeys record or your love of nature for example these small things are things that make you an individual songwriter. And sometimes you can't work out exactly what they are. And it's you, isn't it? It's you being you. And that is, and that is, I think, the most important thing is you have to become you as a songwriter. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> yeah, it's also when you're living your life, there's some witness or something that knows when you're in a moment where there's a song idea. It's kind of crazy. Oh, it's like you're, you know, that's it's like you're having a conversation with someone and you say, hold on a second. Can I use that? That's a great title, you know? 
I'm forever doing that. It happened to me the other day. I'm just like, I always feel like I'm not quite fully present because you're, I'm sort of on the hunt for, uh, for a song title or, or for, like you said, some, uh, something in the conversation which will inspire. So I think you're right. You're witnessing, whilst being there as a person and a mum and a dad and whatever, you're witnessing the moment to hunt for scraps of uh, seeds for songs. So that, that's how I feel it. Yeah. Yeah, it's that that those are moments when something's tugging at you, even if you're not in a songwriting mode, you know, I mean, thank God for the phone, you know, I put so many ideas and I mean, I have something in, you know, I haven't done anything with it yet, but I was just driving along and I just turned my phone on and I'm just singing in the car and I listened to it and I was like, this is pretty good lyric actually, you know, and, and I think I can kind of make out a melody and can hear the car going in the background, but you know, it, it's important to grab those moments when you can, and you can always sort out the details later. Absolutely. Do you, well, again, one of the things I enjoyed about writing with you was the, the, and also you've mentioned it today about changing points of view, changing from the first person, to the second to the third person, you know, changing subject matter sometimes whilst you're writing a song to see if it brings something else out. That to me um, comes from, well, I'm going to assume here that you read a lot. Um, do you read a lot? And is reading important to a songwriter, do you think? Oh, I think it's so important. And I used to, when I lived in England, I read a lot. And, you know, I was thinking, I was super stressed the other day and I was thinking, you know, books are just the best thing ever because you can escape into another time and a place and you can really be there. And uh, it, it, the world's insanely fast now. Things just, you know, every day there's just so much going on. And and I, re I remember I, I listened to this, like, you know, political pundit, podcasts my alliteration there um and they were talking about things that happened in like 2015 that at the time seemed so extreme and they, they were joking saying it sounds so quaint now doesn't it <laughs> you know like, things that you know we're we're at the shock you know and everything is just intense and fast so the idea of reading and being able to lie on the couch and spend an afternoon and just be somewhere else is really appealing to me. But the truth is I can't slow down enough to, to do it anymore. I don't want to say anymore with a period of, after it as if it's a fact, but I have so much to do, I, I, I'm a pretty high revved engine doing a lot of things that I love doing. Um, it's really hard to just sit on a couch. And if I did, it would be an anomaly. Like I wouldn't get through a whole book. There's just no way, no way. It's interesting. I agree with you, actually. I used to read a lot, you know, and I feel exactly the same way that time seems to have shifted where there isn't, it's put, it's just a choice, I suppose, at the end of the day. One could sit down and decide to read, but it does feel different, the pace of life these days. I actually made myself re read a book a month about two or three years ago, pre-pandemic, as an exercise, and, and it was great, but then that became a chore, you know, having to stick to that. So, um, yeah, it's interesting how that's changed. One question I'd like to ask you is, when you began songwriting or when you were starting out as a songwriter, was there anybody who you um, were particularly inspired by or influenced by? Uh, completely. I mean, well, first of all, when I was younger, it was, you know, well, now, now I don't, my Beatles favorite phase is not their early phase. But I remember really being influenced by things on like Rubber Soul, you know, like Michelle, Ma Bell, and, yeah. um, you know, just the musicality and the presentation that really influenced me. Um, you know, uh, later I I loved uh, Joni Mitchell. Um, 
you know, James Taylor, early James Taylor, uh, a little bit of Ricky Lee Jones, but I, I you know, I love Ricky Lee Jones's writing. People have said to me, and it's always annoying when anybody compares you to someone else because you feel like I'm me, I'm not like somebody else. Um, we said, oh, you sound like Ricky Lee Jones, you know, and but but I haven't listened to a lot of Ricky Lee. I think it's just the uh, timbre of my voice is is younger, you know. Um, I sound a lot younger than I am, and, and you know, I kind of retain this youthful sound, and and she has this, you know, kind of childlike quality to her her delivery, and a, and a fantastic writer. Um, what else did I listen? Well, then I went through my teenage phase of like live at Leeds and I loved Quadrophenia. I was so into that record and I listened to some Alice Cooper, uh, David Bowie and his blue eyed soul phase, you know, young Americans, um, uh, just you know, some hair bands, I guess, you know, Jojo Gun or something, you know, just, it was a pretty wide palette of, you know, things that were singer songwriter and kind of rocky. It's interesting that, cause I can hear that in your, I can hear that in your records cause there's elements where it does get heavy, you know, and there's that, there's that, that kind of who feeling. And then interesting, you said Ricky Lee Jones, cause my um, wife's a huge fan of Ricky Lee Jones. And there's a song called Satellite. And it's just like an an, an ambience and it, where her voice, like yours, in, has that kind of far-reaching, otherworldly, ethereal thing. And so that's really interesting to hear because it's not in any way, it doesn't sound the same, like you said, but there's just an area of her writing, which um, since you mentioned that, I can kind of hear that a little bit but it's i like that like you said about the throwaway songs sometimes my favorite songs are throwaway songs that people you know everyone has their big anthem or their big most most popular song which i think you know are often more commercial songs but those kind of throwaway songs and i don't mean that in a derogative way but those little secret songs you know like uh like i think show me how and i also think like dominoes but also jeff buckley for me there's a track called everybody here wants you there's little or morning theft as well. There's little secret songs which um, you know, Dylan and Bowie, they all have them. But is that is that There's a the, title? Morning Theft? Yeah, Morning Theft. It's a song by Jeff Buckley. And I love that title. It's a great song just about how he's in love with this woman and he's just writing from the perspective of of her kind of leaving in the morning. And it's just a little thing, you know, it's not of one of his famous songs, but you know. Like in your songwriting suite of songs, I, the the songs that I've kind of really fallen in love with are those kind of more elusive kind of um, things, a bit like um, Ricky Lee Jones. So that was interesting to hear that that was a, an influence. Yeah, she's very cinematic, and I, I and Joni Mitchell is too. I love music that you can see. I love songs that you can walk inside of, and I and I strive for that. And I think one of my I think one of my truth detectors when I'm writing is to really slow down. Like the thing that I cannot do when I'm reading a book, yeah. I do when I'm writing a song yeah. because I want every moment you're in the song, I want to be able to see it, touch it, taste it and be there. I don't like to speed past yeah. any moment. Yeah. I don't, you know, forget, don't bore us, get to the chorus. Just don't bore us, period. Yeah, <laughs> you know? That's so true. And, yeah. So I, 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 yeah, I love that ethereal going your, places. Your songs have like a location. Do you, did, are you in like a, is there imagery when you, I mean, I know you're going to write imagery, but do, do the songs feel like a location as you're writing them? Um, I don't think that intellectually about it, but I like, you know, songs are ethereal, but I like them to present earthy, worldly, real things you can smell and touch. I One of the things I did during the pandemic is I was doing a lot of prose writing. I was constantly in classes and writing um, memoir type stuff, and it 
it also informed my songwriting to a certain extent because there, you know, there's a thing called image moment, which is psychological time versus real time, which is again, going back to lying on the couch, reading a book. What's beautiful about it is it stretches out time yeah. because a psychological moment can last forever when a, a minute just goes by. But the way you stretch time is you bring in mood, lighting, set, costume, smell, you know, a small prop on the floor, um, internal thoughts going alongside. The mo like the more of that you bring in, you can take a minute of time and that minute feels like an experience. Yeah. Where if you're driving in your car and you're going to pick this up, a, a minute goes by, another minute goes by, and you're, you're not really present. So one of the gifts of songwriting for me is to create an opportunity, not just for myself, although I totally do it for myself, is, you know, to offer it as a place to be, yeah. you know, a place to come become present. You know, and, and artists... That's really, I think, our job in whatever medium we're in is to speak the things that maybe are below the awareness of people going through their lives. And it's like, oh, you're saying what I feel, you know, yeah. you're speaking what I wanted to say and couldn't find the words for. Yeah. I love when songs do that for me. I, I think you're right. That is such a motivating feeling to to hope that something you write for yourself may be a location for someone to find something about themselves in. You know, that's that's really eloquently and beautifully put what you just said there. That's exactly how I feel about it. Um, I was going to ask you actually, in terms of you said you said a few times about having a truth detector when you write. After you've written a song, is there anybody that you go to to run a song by them or anyone's opinion you trust in terms of giving you a yes or no on a song? Or do you know it yourself? Um, so it's often my co-writer who I'm working with, but um, not really. Uh, well, actually, first of all, I don't know anybody who's harder to please than myself in terms of in yeah. terms of lyrics. Um, in terms of presentation and production, I go to my sons cool. um, and and sometimes other people, the, the, the gift for me of going to Muscle Shoals recently was during this whole record and, you know, the on again, off again pandemic, you know, which is, it's never been off, but you know, a lot of people have been going out and doing things as if, you know, it's over. And there was, you know, and, and now it's winter again, and there's varying degrees of caution. And, but basically, you know, it was a whole curbing of my traveling and being part of a community, you know, the lifestyle I'd grown to be fueled by, because I'm social to a certain extent. And I didn't have that. So I was working like here we are on Zoom, you know, which is great. And we, you know, we wrote a great song on Zoom and I wrote songs that I'm recording with people on Zoom. But I lost a feeling of having an experience recording Yeah, because I was doing one thing at a time. Or even if someone else was singing or playing on it, I'd send it to them and then they'd send me back the file and I'd import the file and, you know, edit it and how I liked it. And I didn't really, I never had an audience. Yeah. You know, it was just me in a room full of mirrors listening to my record. So when I went to Muscle Shoals and I had done a lot of work on the songs at that point, suddenly I had a band in there and people were hearing these songs and it was filling the studio and filling the rooms and somebody would go, Hey, I got this idea for a tambourine part, or um, let's, let's go out on the same mic together and sing this backing vocal part. And it, Oh God, I just can't even begin to tell you. I, I just, I never got tired I, for six days in a row 
I just, you know, I'd go to sleep at the latest possible moment and wake up at the earliest possible moment. And I was just on the whole time because I didn't need to sleep because I was so hungry for an experience and to feel connected with people that I just drank it up. I love that. It's exciting, isn't it? That's the thing. It's, and the pandemic took that away. The The excitement of being in a room with people, creating a song, which is like two dimensional into a three dimensional, I don't know, 12 dimensional thing is so exciting. You know, it's a beautiful, collaborative and very exciting thing to do with your life. I put cellos on our song. Wait, do you hear? I can't. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I, on my phone, on my phone, I have a little demo of you singing it back at the end of the day. And now and again, I listen to it, and your voice sounds. It's one of those little moments that would just, you know, happened. But I really like listening to it because the song has just been born, and it's just this little moment, like you said earlier about moments. So I'm really looking forward to hear how hear how it's uh, developed. Yeah, that that performance, actually, at one point, I thought, I'm just going to put that on the record, because it was just such a honest, good performance. I think I only stopped and like corrected a note once in it. And also the phone, it, it just has the best sound when you're like putting everything in this little microphone, and it's compressing it. In the end, what's really amazing, and I'm only thinking this now, where I'm sitting right now is, you know, maybe two feet away from where I was sitting when we wrote the song. Yeah. Yeah. And the recording of the song was exactly where we wrote it. I had my computer set up and a little SM7 microphone, which I didn't even have a stand. I l l leaned it on the table with an acoustic guitar leaning over to it. And I put it down with a, you know, a click track and saying a bunch of takes of the vocal into that microphone. And that that's what I took to Muscle Shoals. And when I heard it, it sounded, why does it sound so good? I mean, I, I, I literally just, you know, was leaning over my dining room table. I agree. It's really got like a, a quality of that recording. And I think possibly maybe it just being captured so quickly you know like it's like the big friendly giant from Rodal just collecting dreams it was like it was captured very quickly after we wrote it so but it's a, yeah. it's, it's a fabulous um fabulous uh performance do you have any advice for people that want to be a songwriter what piece pearls of wisdom could you give them well I'm great at unsolicited advice, but you just solicited some. So, uh, well, first of all, you said, do I have advice for people who want to be a songwriter? I would say, if you don't want to be a songwriter, my advice is be one. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. And the reason is that I don't know anything else that will so effectively ensure the possibility of sanity. Yeah. Um, I can't guarantee sanity, but I think it presents the best promise of sanity of anything out there. And, you know, um, you know, I, I think it's better than antidepressants and it's better than, you know, sedatives it's better than alcohol it's better you know it's it's better than everything um because it's the one place where even if you're in circumstances you know in which you feel like your freedom isn't what you, you don't have the choices you would love to have you maybe you don't have the job you'd like to have or maybe you're not living in the the you know, the flat or the circumstances you want to live in. It's this private world where you get to be entirely who you are without any censorship. Um, you can, it, it's just like you can be your own, the captain of your own ship in the world of a song. And I just can't imagine anything better than that, you know? So be a songwriter. 
And you don't have to be good at an instrument and you don't have to be good at singing. I just performed the other day at somebody's house and I was horrible. I was just like, oh God, and they they just think, oh, because she's really not all she's meant to have to be. Like I just could not sing at all. And I've I've done master classes with people who don't play an instrument and they say, Well, I got this lyric, and they just sing, sing it a cappella, you know, and the song is still there. So, you know, all that mystification of you have to be, don't, you know, don't compare yourself to finished records and go, I'm not good enough. Because those records, people probably listen to the song 300 times at least. And they tune things and they redid things and they mix things and they chop things and they edited things. And by the time it's done, you know, your little new baby song does not have to compare to that. Um, and yeah, don't be don't write cliches, don't be indulgent, find the best parts and repeat them and make sure you can sway or tap your foot or move your body to it. Yeah, that's, that's it. That is some priceless advice there. And I agree with all of it. And hearing you talk about that love of song that I feel exactly the same way, you know, it's, it is better than anything, you know, it's, it's really something that th is the one thing that I feel like has never let me down or will never let me down. Even if songs don't finish the love of that and the process of writing is, is the one like reliable thing that I can always go to and love. So let me just ask you one last question. Is yeah. there a song that you wish you had written that you love more than any other song? Oh gosh, I'm sure that answer has changed over the years. Uh, hmm. A song I wished I'd written. I don't know. I honestly don't know. A, a, a song I wish I'd written, You've Got to Hide Your Love Away. <laughs> Great Which is, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I think they they were inspired by Bob Dylan. Yeah. Um, but that's an old one. I, I'm sure there are more. I'm sure there are more. Um, it probably wouldn't be very recent. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a song. I, well, it's a record I love. Uh, I, I had it. Uh, oh, I, I love um, I Only Have Eyes For You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it was an old song that was redone I don't think that the version that I know is is an original, but I always love that song because I could escape in it. I could just always escape in. I think I heard the original version not that long ago, actually, and or maybe I think it's the original version. It might not be, but it sounded from like maybe late fifties, early sixties, the recording. And it, you're right; you can totally get lost in that. It's really maybe like takes you away maybe um stardust <laughs> um yeah oh and what's the one the Mop mamas and the papas did that was a whole hoagie carmichael song i think um da, 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 uh, dream a little dream yeah, of that's, me yeah. that's a good one yeah um yeah. i like those little ones that you can just they're just little little melodies in your head with little you know thoughts fascinating that's really fascinating so obviously it changes all the time but you aren't it's nice to hear those answers on the spot and you've got to hide your love away was a key moment for me you know when when they're in the help film living in the same house together and it's color and he's sitting in the kind of floor singing that song that was a moment when I was a kid where I just, uh, that's a golden, I, I know what I want to be, you know, that's, I want to be him singing that song, which is so, one of John's great skills was being so melodic and hooky, but so honest, you know, it, it, what he had to say 
you listen to the lyrics of that song, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty big what he's saying, but in a very kind of, again, easy way to hear it. But yeah, he was the master of that for me, just writing those really honest, raw, but almost divinely inspired songs about mental health and reality and the nature of reality but again just delivered in a little nutshell for you to take home and think about absolutely i think really this it's it's too soon to know what it is because i'm in the middle of it but the record that i'm making now i think it's filled with songs i wish i wrote I love and that. i and, and i did you know That's i great. mean Maybe that's a maybe that's a good album title. That's a great for, album title. Songs I wish songs I'd, I wish I'd written, and yeah. you know it's full of songs that you you'd written. <laughs> I love that. Um, I love that because that is true. Sometimes I've had this similar experience. Not maybe a whole album, but sometimes I've written one recently, which fell out the sky. And I'm after writing it, I thought, you know, I always wanted to write a song like that. You know, I always wished that I could. So I've, you know, that's that's lovely to hear that that's what's happening in your album. Yeah, because I I only have myself now. I'm like, like I'm not working with the producer and I'm not going, you know, I, I started off working with Fernando Perdomo, um, but quickly I just had my own aesthetic that I wanted and, you know, he'd put parts down and I, I realized I'm a, I'm a, a I'm like a sculpt sculptor, you know, it's, I make records more like Rodin, <laughs> you know, it's just like, take away everything that isn't Michael. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so true though, actually, in, in terms of making a song a record, I once heard it described as you get this really clapped out banger of a car and you have to turn it into like the most beautiful Aston Martin or Jaguar, but also that idea of taking away everything that isn't Michael is, 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 a really brilliant way of summarizing how to make a record because you don't necessarily know but you're just taking things away until you get it I love that yeah yeah and and so now the only level of approval and standard is me great and I'll open something up and I'll go you know why isn't this working why isn't this mix not moving me and you know then I'll start taking things out great replacing things yeah. and just only keep on what I go yeah that's real that that's doing it that's moving me and if there's anything on there that isn't doing that that I don't believe you said that thing about believability which I appreciate I was working with Van Dyke Parks who's absolutely brilliant and I had this song that I did in my studio and it was very John Lennon like it just I don't know. It was just really a cool thing. I think maybe I say that because I, I had this slap back on my voice, but the melody was kind of bluesy and I had these drums and this bass line and it was a really cool thing. And when I went to record, I was working with Dave Way. Um, he said, let's do that song. I like that one. Let's do it. I said, okay, great. I don't have a lyric yet. He said, well, you know, so then when I was working with Van Dyke Parks, he wanted to do two songs and he'd chosen the other song. And I said, okay, how about this one? I think Dave suggested, give him that one. So I had this, I don't remember how many pieces were in the orchestra, maybe 20. I had the whole thing cut at the greatest drummer, Charlie Drayden playing drums, just the greatest band, you know, Sean Hurley on bass. It was just the, the, the greatest band. And Van Dyke Parks is putting this incredible arrangement on it. And I still don't have the lyric. I, it's it's the absolute thing that I always say never do. And uh, he was calling me and saying, Louise, it would really help me to know when I'm conducting, you know, what the song is about. And the answer I had to give him was, I'd give you the lyric, but of all the versions I've written, I still don't believe myself. And I wouldn't sign off on it, you know? I, I just... I mean, I love that you didn't sign off, that you were so authentic to, you know, that commitment to yourself. That's that's very pure and well done. This song is called Oh My God. Um, You've also and, just... and, and, 
I'm happy. I, I was happy with it in the end. You've also just given me a song title there, which might be a nice way to finish off this podcast. I still don't believe myself. I think that's a good. Uh, little oh, song. that is that is that's great. I love that. Thank you very much for your time. Just tell us quickly where people can. You said you got a podcast called Song Chronicles, which sounds great. Yes, I do. I have. Uh, I'm about to put out season three. Great. And it's. Uh, let's see. Where can you find? You can find it anywhere. Um, it. But I do have a main website, which is songchroniclespodcast.com. dot com, and that has the blog and the pictures of all the you know people I talk to. And, you know, there's fantastic interviews. There's, I mean, people, I just find every conversation so fascinating and I learn so much from people. Um, my last one was with Lady Blackbird and Chris Seafried, and um, she's doing really well over there in, in Europe. And it just, you know, world class singer, like you know, as good as any of the classic, amazing, you know, singers ever. Um, there's a fantastic interview with Bob Ezrin, Great. you know, who produced The Wall. Yeah. It's in two parts. He's the best storyteller. And it's just, it's, there's great interviews there. Fabulous. Well, I'm going to head over there tonight after. <laughs> check that out because you know that's great and obviously um your music is everywhere and it's fabulous but you're making a new record right now so we'll maybe hear that in 2023 is that the plan yeah that's the plan and if you you know if you want to play any of that little demo on the podcast i i don't mind well, let's maybe do that that'd be great actually we will do that that's great louise <laughs> thank you so much for your time thank you so much really appreciate it thanks for talking to me